Okay. Um, good morning and welcome everybody to BC 106, um, the course on interpreting scripture. Welcome everyone to the class. Um, thank you for being here. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone who is in the class, present here and present online. And Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher today. The Holy Spirit will illuminate our hearts and minds and speak to us, uh, teach us, enlighten us, uh, give us instruction, give us clarity, give us wisdom as we learn, O oh God. And we pray that we will be able to apply these truths, apply these insights to our lives and ministries as we live for you and as we serve people. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and share the notes that we were using um, last week and um, quickly review what we covered. And um, then we still have a little bit to finish in that chapter on culture. So we'll do that. So we started talking about uh, different guidelines or rules in interpreting scripture right the first thing a uh, first aspect of these rules or guidelines is to be aware of the cultural context right that means there are certain things in the bible that were given to a people addressing something that is very cultural it was for them in their time and so we need to understand that. We need to recognize that. When something is given that is specific to a people and their culture, then that is not necessarily permanent. It's not transferable. Right? It's, it was meant for them. But we can look at the principle. What was the principle behind it? And then see if that principle is applicable for us today. If that principle is transferable to us today. Right? So that's one thing. Uh, and so we were looking at some examples, and um, we went through this little table where we looked at different, uh, just a sample, a small list of things, and uh, we said, you know, let's see if these are permanent or these are temporary. Temporary means it was only for them. Permanent means we also practice. It's for all people, all time. And then we began to kind of wrap this up by, by giving out, outlining these things in a, uh, as principles. You know, how do we apply this? So we started talking about this and then we paused somewhere here. So let's just review. So, number one, so here are the principles. How do you apply this in our interpreting of scripture? Number one, some situations, commands, or principles. Are repeatable, continuous, or not revoked? Right? Some things God said, He may have said it in the Old Testament, He may have said it uh, in the New Testament, but it has not been revoked. It's still there. Okay? So that means we continue to observe it, we continue to follow it. Or they pertain to moral and theological sub subjects or are repeated elsewhere in scripture and therefore they are permanent and transferable to us. All right, so we said, okay, example, capital punishment. Uh, it was given there in Genesis 9-6, but it was not revoked anywhere else. That means death for death. So that's okay because God didn't change that. Uh, but of course, in different countries, every country has their own judicial system. So the country will decide. But from a biblical perspective, we are saying there is uh, capital punishment in the Bible. Polygamy, that was practiced in the Old Testament, but the New Testament explicitly revokes it. Right? The New Testament says, no, you don't practice that. You don't do it. 
right? So we can't. For example, some years ago in Bangalore City, there was this pastor. Uh, he was having a ministry. Uh, it was going on. And uh, he had his wife. And I don't know whether he had children or not. I, I, I don't know too much. But then suddenly he decided to marry somebody else in his church. I mean, you know, get on. And then he used the excuse, ah, David did it. So was that right or wrong? Wrong. He's using Bible. He's saying David. He could have said Solomon or he could have said anybody else in the Old Testament. Doesn't matter. But he said David did. But hey, New Testament is very clear. Right? We don't. So when it comes to marriage, New Testament. Right? Because things have changed. Right? A Nazarite. In the Old Testament, Nazarite, God said, you know, you grow your, let your hair grow, you don't drink wine, and all of the clear instructions. Uh, in the New Testament, we don't say, hey, Nazarites in the Old Testament grew long hair, so we also grow long hair. I mean, it's, it's, you know, no, New Testament says, you know, it's, it's not something that men normally do. I mean, if somebody wants to have long hair, that's their choice, but you don't use the Bible to cover that. Uh, and so the Bible is its own authority in these things. The second principle, and we need to pick up from here, is this. Some situations, commands, or principles are for an individual. Uh, it's specific to an individual. It's non-repeatable circumstance. It's a non-moral non or non-theological subject uh, and has been revoked, and therefore it's not transferable for us today. Example. God told Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, go offer him as a sacrifice. So you want to say Abraham is a father of faith, <laughs> so we also have to go do it. Is that correct? <laughs> Pimel was nodding his head. <laughs> That's not correct. Right. Uh, God, that was specific to Abraham. God told Abraham. And we also know that God didn't let him actually do it. Right? God knew Abraham was going to obey. But let him demonstrate his obedience. Let him demonstrate. Let him actually go through it. But I will stop it. Now, we cannot say, oh, God told Abraham, sacrifice, I also sacrifice. No. Right? That was to a particular individual at a particular time. So it's not transferable. That, you know, that, that's just one example. So like that, we'll find other situations in the Bible where God may have spoken to a person, telling them to do something that's specific for them. Right? The principle of obedience applies to all of us. We're all called to obey God. But we're not all called to sacrifice children, our children. That's, you know, like that. No. We're all called to obey. Principle of obedience, yes. Not the practice. So we have to understand the difference. Number three. Uh, some situations or commands pertain to cultural settings that only partially similar to ours, in which only the principles are transferable. That means they did it like that, we do it like this. So we are not following the same practice. Uh, we practice it in a different way, but the principle is the same. Right? So example, we talked about this last, last week, how we greet one another. You know, in different cultures, people greet one another in different ways. Handshake, bowing, touching the feet, or whatever, you know, hugging, uh, so many different, you know, different cultures, they express that greeting in different ways. Fine. And your culture, whatever cultures. The point is, you greet one another. Right? You're hospitable, you're kind, uh, you're expressing that greeting to one another. It's not the following of that explicit practice across cultures. No. You, you do it however you want. Number four, um, some situations or commands 
uh, pertain to settings, cultural settings with no similarities, but in which the principles are transferable. Example, when Moses was facing, uh, saw God in that burning bush, God said, Moses, take off your sandals because the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. Does that mean every time we pray, we have to take off our sandals? No. That was something specific given to Moses at that moment. Right? So many others prayed with their sandals on. Right? But the principle is we show reverence to God. We recognize and we reverence God's presence, however you want. Some people may kneel down, some people, whatever, however. You, you recognize and you reverence the presence of God. And reverence is mainly from the heart. Right? You respect, you reverence the presence of God. Yeah? So it's not like, oh, God told Moses, take your sandals off, therefore everybody take the sandals. No, it's, it's not a rule. If they, some people want to do it, it's up to them. Think of another situation where in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 to 16, the Apostle Paul writes about women covering their heads. Right. So, again, this is a very, uh, what to say, uh, a passage, or this is a Thing, a topic that a lot of people argue about and maybe not all over the world but maybe in certain parts of the world this becomes a big point of argument and, and I remember I know like sometimes in pastors conferences when somehow when we get into this subject there's arguments you know uh, and I've, I've seen that happen um, but how do we understand first Corinthians chapter 11 verses 2 to 16 Right, so if you turn there with me, I'll just quickly uh, point a few things out for us. First Corinthians chapter eleven, because in some parts, especially of our country, uh, in India, uh, and in certain denominations, this becomes a big issue. Right, you have to cover your head. All, I mean, women. All women have to cover their head when they come. Yeah, and they use this passage. This is the only passage in the whole Bible. Uh, in the New Testament that is addressing this. And uh, you know, if you look at it carefully, uh, let us see what conclusions we can come to. First Corinthians chapter 11, right? Um, so, and I'll just quickly go through this. In verse 2, the Apostle Paul is telling them about traditions that he delivered to them. He says, okay, these are some practices, some customs that I delivered to you, right? And then he begins to talk about headship. That's verse 3. In headship, the word term headship has to do with God's government. It's not talking about superiority, but it's talking about this is how the government of God flows. That's headship. Meaning, if you look at it in verse 3, it says, the head of the woman is the man. The head of the man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. But we also know that man and woman are co-equal. We also know Christ and God, God the Father, are co-equal. God the Father is not superior to God the Son. They are co-equal. They are the Godhead. Romans 1 says they are the Godhead. Philippians 2 says, though he was equal to God. John 1 says the word was God. It doesn't say the word was less than God or the word was second to God. The word was God. So the truth is God the Father, God the eternal word, whom we now call Christ or Son of God or Jesus or so many names we have, and God the Holy Spirit, they're all co-equal. So sometimes when we say second person of the Trinity, that's actually very misleading. He's not, he's not quote unquote, second, he's co-equal. When you say third person of the Trinity, that's very misleading. It's not the Holy Spirit comes third in rank. No, the Spirit of God is co-equal uh, with the Father and with the Son. They're co-equal. Understanding me? Okay. 
So even the Bible teaches man and woman are co-equal. Example, First Peter 3 and verse 7, uh, I think it's verse 7, it says, you know, husbands, love your wives because you are heirs together of the grace of God. The husband is not superior to the wife. They're co-equal. The, in the eyes of God, they are the same. Just like Christ and God the Father are equal. However, when the term headship is used, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, it's talking about God's government. For example, in a local church, the pastor is a leader. It doesn't mean the pastor is superior to the congregation. He's just a sinner uh, like everybody else in the congregation. Right? He's just another man or just another person. But in that setting, the Holy Spirit has put him in a place of headship or leadership. You understand? It? There is co-equality, but there is also, in, in terms of government, in God's authority, there is headship. So that's what's being expressed here in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 11. That in God's government, this is how authority flows in the government of God. From the father, through Christ, through the husband, to the wife. It doesn't, they're all co-equal, husband and wife are co-equal. But in terms of God's government, authority, this is how it flows. That's why he says the, the husband is the head of the wife in God's government. You understand it? So that's, he introduces that in verse 3. And then he begins to address something about covering the head. He says, look, if a woman does not cover her head and then she prays and prophesies, that's not right. In that context, he's talking to the Corinthians. But then he also says, if a man, verse 7, a man shouldn't cover his head. Okay. Those of you who have helmet, who wear helmets, or you wear caps, that time can you pray or not? Suppose you're wearing a helmet, you're going on a bike. Suppose you have to be on the bike for two hours. Does that mean for two hours you cannot pray? Right? Because your head is covered, no? <laughs> and he says here in verse 7, a man should not cover his head. Or if you're wearing a cap, maybe it's very hot. That time, can you pray or not? We pray, right? Okay. So I'm just, you know, just showing, you know, how silly it can get sometimes when when we think. All right. So he says a man should not cover his head. Right. And then, uh, then he says, um, verse eleven. So the reason is a woman needs a symbol of authority over her. So this covering that a woman puts over her head is symbolic, he says. Right? Um, it's a symbol that, verse 10, it's a symbol of authority. That means it's a sign that she is a married woman. That's all. So keep that in mind. Why was he encouraging women to cover the head? It was a symbol. It was a sign that that woman is a married woman. Symbol of authority. Or uh, also, it's a symbol that she's under headship. It's a sign under headship. Okay. So he said, that's why you do it. And then, but then he says, verse 11 and 12, Neither is man independent of woman, or woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, so also, uh, as woman came from man, even so man comes to the woman, all things are from God. In other words, he's saying, hey, ultimately, we are all equal. That means, woman came from man. Man came from woman. That means we, we are co-equal before God. 
And look how he finishes this. Then he says, verse 16, If anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. He says, hey, if you want to argue about this, let me tell you, this is not our custom. And other churches do not practice this. Very clearly, verse 16. So that means in the passage itself, he is saying, what I am telling you is for you. It is for the Corinthian church. We do not have any such custom. So he starts talking, verse 2, we said, I know, uh, these are the customs I want to remind you about. Verse 16, we do not have such kind of customs, nor do the churches of God. I mean, this is not something that all the churches practice. So that, therefore, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 16, is something very specific to the Corinthian church. Although Paul is using a very sound theological argument here, he is also addressing a cultural practice that is very specific for the Corinthian church. So in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 16, we can look at the theology of it, gain a lot of insight on it, but the cultural practice, leave it there for the Corinthian church. The practice of head covering. So what was the problem? So you look back into the Corinthian church. What do we know about the Corinthian church, their culture, their time, what had happened? Well, in the time that of Paul's writing and Paul's visit to Corinth in his second missionary journey, when he came to Corinth, Corinth at that time was what we would call today as the sin capital of the world. That means there were certain cities in the world that were known for big things. Right? Athens uh, was, was, was known for it being the intellectual capital. It was a place of thought and learning and philosophy. The great Greek philosophers, they came from Athens. Corinth, on the other hand, was a capital of immorality, idolatry and immorality. Right? So these, uh, so they had these big Corinthian temples uh, of idolatry and where there were huge numbers of temple prostitutes serving. That's why in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he says, hey, such were some of you. You were fornicators, you were adulterers, you were like this, you were like that. I mean, they came from a very... Uh, sinful lifestyle. And part of being a temple prostitute, they had to shave their heads. Okay? So this is all cultural information. And you can read this anywhere, any historical cultural information about Corinth, you, you can read this. So these temple prostitutes had to shave their head. So now you imagine all many of these people are being saved they come into the church. What was their former life? They were serving in the temple as temple prostitutes. They had their head shaved. Now they're coming into the church. And so in the church, Paul is just he suggests this is what you do. You know, women, you cover your head. Right? So there's it's a symbol, right? I'm under I'm either married or I'm submitting to authority. And says so you cover your heads. Women, you cover your heads. Right? And men, you don't need to cover your heads. Right? That's all. It's for the Corinthian church. It's to address a particular situation. That doesn't mean a man who covers his head can never pray or prophesy. Because if we enforce this, then we have to enforce it in its entirety. We can't just say only women cover your head. Hey, that means men also must not cover the head anytime. Okay. If you if it applies in one's context, it also applies everywhere else. You know, so you have to if you enforce half of it, enforce the other half also. Okay, so understand this was a cultural thing. Paul was addressing women. You cover your head uh, when you are coming together. Uh, as a symbol of authority, either you're, it's an expression that you are married or you're submitting to the headship that God has put 
in that place, right? as a symbol, of, that's all. But he clearly says, verse 16, it's not something we practice in all the churches. It's not something we're going and telling every church to do. And you correctly, you don't find it written in any other epistle. Most of the things of Paul are repeated in other epistles, you know, when he talks about other things, walking in the spirit, walking in love, this, that. But just head covering, you don't find it repeated in any other episode. Okay, Anand? In the churches, right? Yeah. See, if somebody wants to practice it, somebody wants to observe it, it's up to them. But we don't, maybe should not make it a rule. So like you said, there are certain denominations that have made it a rule. Is it right? It's not right. Is it biblical? It's not biblical. But they've made it a rule. So those who are part of that denomination, they submit themselves to it. Is it necessary? No. Is it biblical? No. But those who have made a choice to be part of the denomination, they do that. You know, for example, there are certain denominations where you have to wear white. When you go to church, you have to wear full white. Is it in the Bible? No. Is it biblical? No. Is it a spiritual requirement? No. But that denomination has made it a rule. So people who are part of the denomination, they follow that, but it does not make them any more spiritual than anybody else. Right? So it's not a biblical thing. It's more of a denominational rule, uh, which they have enforced, and people have to follow it who are part of that denomination. Okay, so here's an example where the Bible is very clear that something was very culturally specific. Plus, when you study the history and culture, you'll know why it was given. Plus, when you look at the scriptures, you'll know that it's not repeated anywhere else. If it was meant for everybody, he would have written to every church. Hey, when you come together, all the ladies must cover your heads. Uh, and there would be a very theological reason for it. You know, but you don't find it anywhere else. It's only here. So it's very something very specific to the Corinthian church. And when you look into the background, you understand why, uh, why he had to do that. Okay. Um, so even in our Indian culture, you know, we uh, we realize that in different cultures there are certain ways that women show that they are married. Like especially in the north, they would put the red. Uh, Thing here, you know, it's a sign that they are, that woman is that lady is married. You know? uh, I think in in South you have to you wear your tali or something. You wear that different ways to show that woman is she's a married woman. These are just customary custom practices in that culture. That's how they show that that person is married. Generally, in many cultures, people wear a ring. Right, a ring is a symbol that you are married. So. The, now, some people don't wear a ring, but most uh, cultures, wearing a ring is a sign. This is just a cultural thing, right? It's not a spiritual thing, but there is no chapter in verse saying, thou shall wear a ring. <laughs> it's only a cultural thing to show that you are a married person. That's all. So there are so many different ways that people show it uh, and, and so on. Okay, let me just see if there are any questions on... Uh, any questions from the uh, those who are online so far? Cultural, what is cultural? What's temporary? Uh, what's permanent? Okay. So when we in when we are reading scripts and we see things that are cultural, try to understand the feel. I mean, see if something that is theological. Uh, or something that teaches about God and His ways, or any principle that we can apply. Okay, think about that, rather than imitating the practice. Right? Is there a theological principle that we can take, apply? Like we said last class, washing the feet. Okay, We don't go and wash the feet, but there's a good principle there that we can apply today, you know, of humility, of, of serving one another in love. You know, that's, a, that's the principle we apply. Right? Uh, the actual practice we don't follow. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, no questions for now. So let's get into the next lesson. I'll try to 
cover this as well. Yes. Okay. What clothes must pastors wear? I know I've had all kinds of emails. Sometimes, you know, the, some people don't like the clothes I wear. Oh, they used to. So there used to be a time uh, when we were in a different auditorium. Uh, I used to wear half sleeve shirt, shirt left out, like that. Uh, I, I think you would call it Hawaiian shirt, like just loose shirt. Then I got one. Uh, I got somebody. Somebody was watching those days. Somebody we used to have TV programs. So this used to go on TV. So some pastor, some some other state watched. He sent me an email. You should not be wearing clothes, shirt like this. You know. So different people, you know, they have their own. So I don't bother about it. I, I wear what I'm comfortable with, right? So right from the time we started, I always just wear a shirt and trouser. That's it. You know, now I may wear half sleeves or my fold my sleeves or whatever. I just wear what I'm comfortable with. So the answer to your question is um, each preacher or pastor or minister should wear what they are comfortable with. And you wear what you're comfortable with. That's it. Uh, now, the only thing we can say is as a guideline, right? It should be uh, decent. It should be. Uh, it should, it should, uh, I would say, be relevant to the audience who is standing. Like, see, now I'm wearing jeans. I don't, I don't wear jeans on a Sunday morning service. At least I haven't tried it till now. <laughs> but most other times I'll wear like this jeans, casual. Like when I'm doing this or weekend schools or in any of the youth services, I'll just wear casual. But I don't wear it on a Sunday morning. Sunday morning because. There are older people, adults. It will offend them, at least in our context, right? So I would say we need to be a little sensitive to the people that we are ministering to, uh, so that uh, what we wear doesn't become a hindrance to them from receiving the word of God. Otherwise, they'll be thinking all, all time. They'll be thinking about what you're wearing, not paying attention to the word you're preaching, right? So. I, that's the only point I would say. It's, it's just just be sensitive to your audience, but otherwise just wear what you're comfortable with. Right now, I don't uh, don't think it's right for one pastor to tell another pastor what he should wear. You know, it's uh, it's entirely up to that pastor. Whatever he knows, his he knows his congregation, he knows his people. So, you know, or he he knows whom he's ministering to. So. He can decide. You know, I don't think we should go around telling people what they should wear, unless they are wearing something re really silly. You know. um, so let's go to the next chapter. All right, there's another question here uh, on the chat, Nina. If the cultural practice in the north, Christian, for women is to cover the head while in church, is it better to conform or explain that it is a cultural reference and not really applicable now? Okay, here's an interesting question, right? Where, uh, suppose you go to a church, and suppose you're visiting a church somewhere, and in that congregation, everybody's covering the head. That means before you enter the building, all women must cover the head. What should we do? Should we go and tell them, hey, this is not biblical, not necessary? Or should we just go with the flow? I would say just go with the flow. Right? Just cover your head, sit there for two hours and come. You're not going to lose anything. Right? And, and this doesn't really matter. This is not something we should be fighting about. Right? Uh, don't even worry about it. Right? So Nina, that would be my answer. You know. Um, if people are interested in knowing, uh, uh, you know, they really want to understand whether it's biblical or not, yeah, then we can explain to them. Otherwise, like, you know, if you're visiting some place and people are covering, women are covering their heads, you just cover the heads, enjoy the service, come out. It really doesn't matter. And we don't have to waste our time and energy trying to, uh, you know, 
uh, fight with people about this. I remember once uh, in a pastor's conference, we were teaching about House of God. Uh, this is, I think, in I think it was Pune. I, Pune. I forget which which city. You know, we're doing a pastor's conference, and uh, one pastor asked about this First Corinthians eleven. So I explained. Another pastor disagreed, and it became an argument. <laughs> then I had to, hey guys, calm down. You know, don't fight about this. You know, if you want to cover your head, <laughs> if you want your congregation to cover your head, cover your head. You don't want them, don't cover. It's, let's not fight about something like this. You know, uh, it's it's totally unnecessary. I remember once when I went to one church to preach, and this was a, a Pentecostal type church. I, I was wearing a belt, okay, but the belt was had yellow gold color. It was not gold, you know. You know this belt buckle, right? It can be silver color, it can be gold color, whatever. That happened to be gold color. It's not gold. It's just gold color. Everybody knows, but. Before I could enter the, the building, uh, the I think he was a superintendent, the like person in charge. He took me back. He said, see, in this church, we don't wear any gold. So if you're going to go and preach, you have to take off your belt. <laughs> Only then we can let you inside. I said, that doesn't matter to me at all. <laughs> you know, happily, I took off my belt, left it there, went. Ministered, came back, wore my belt, and went. <laughs> so it's, it's not worth fighting about. You know, I didn't want to argue saying, hey, this is not gold. It is just metal. It's only that color. It's only yellow color. <laughs> I didn't even waste one, one second arg arguing with them. Pointless, right? They have certain rules. Some rules are meaningless. <laughs> but in order to satisfy them, I took out my belt, left it there, went inside, preached. Came out. Yeah, so it's, it really doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, in in both these places, so the question is, I mean, so the question is. In First Timothy chapter two, nine and ten, uh, First Peter three, three to seven, Peter's writing about women, their dressing, you know, and he says the basic. Uh, Paul is writing in First Timothy, and Peter's writing in First Peter, and he's talking about women and their clothing, and the basic thing is it must be with modesty. Right? Women must profess godliness. Means it must be an expression of godliness in both places so the thing is we understand that that's the principle now the the here again how that is applied in different cultures vary for example if you go just if you take a flight Four hour flight, you go to Malaysia or Singapore. There, the ladies will be walking around during summer in shorts. Yeah, you don't see that happening in India. But there it's it's normal. And they will be wearing very the women, you know, will be wearing very thin clothes, you know, with thing. it's part of their culture. It's nobody says anything. Oh, ladies, they are all walking around with shorts. No, it's very hot there. It's on the equator. So uh, that's what they do. Similar, it's only a four hour flight from here. It's totally, culture is totally different. And if you go across, uh, you go the other side, you go to Pakistan, full burqa is like top to head, they covered. Totally opposite. And that's a culture. Uh, you go across to the Western, Western world, North America, South America, Australia. There again, uh, the clothing style is all very different. You can't go and say, don't wear shorts, it's not modest. They'll say, hey, I'm wearing shorts, it's so, so hot here. <laughs> I want to feel comfortable, I'm wearing shorts. Or I'm wearing these clothes, whatever. you know. So the point is, uh, 
if we point out, say from India, we point something, point a finger there, they will point back at us and say, look, you're wearing sari, half your stomach is open. What you're telling us, we have to cover ourselves. Okay, because of anywhere a woman wears a sari, below chest to waist is open. So they'll point their finger at us and say, look at what you're wearing. And you're saying we have to be modest. You you are showing more than we are showing. Yeah, so there is there all these pros and cons of that. So I think the point is this: uh, the principle of First Timothy two and First Peter three is modesty. Um, how that is expressed in different cultures, you know, how what is considered modest uh, in, in different parts of the world, it varies. And we don't shouldn't be wasting our time policing people. Now, don't waste your time, you know, because somebody comes. If a person from some other country comes to India, we can't tell them adapt immediately to our culture. Some people may be sensitive; they'll adapt. Some people are not sensitive; they'll just wear whatever they are wearing in their country because they're here for yeah a short while and they're going back. They don't; they're not. So, uh, I think we should just you know. Hey, uh, understand what, the dynamic, especially in today's world, where people are mixing. You know, they, it's all over the world cultures, especially in urban cities. You know, people that people from different cultures are coming together. We can't police everybody and say, when you are coming to this church, you have to wear like this. You can't do it. You'll be wasting your time. Yeah. So uh, there is modesty. Uh, we have to encourage that, but then just remember, in different cultures, people see it different. Like if you go in, if you go in America, you go to church during summertime, people will be coming in shorts. Like maybe even 70, 70 80 percent in church wearing shorts. So you'd be like, whoa. But for them, it's okay. They're coming to church in shorts. But you have to see the heart. Do they love God? You know. It's part of the culture there, so uh, we shouldn't. I, I would. I wouldn't waste time judging people on that, how they, uh, because all over the world things are practiced differently. Yes, Sean. The question somebody like that will ask is, does that mean when you leave church after two hours, God is not with you? That's the question they will ask us. Like we ask them, hey, you're going to church to worship God. The question they will ask us is, does this mean when you come out of the church building, God is not with you? We are spending more time outside the church building than inside the church. Does that mean all the time God is not with you? No, we say God is with us. Same God is with you. Do you pray? Yes. Do you not do you worship? Yes. Then how come that time you're wearing something else? But, the, but they will say you are the church. Which is true, right? The, the building is not the church. The believer is the church. They say you are the church. So we have to listen to both sides of the argument, you know. And uh, and their argument is also very biblical. <laughs> it's not like you are the church, and God we worship God in spirit and truth. It's not about what we wear. And God looks at the heart, not on the outside. All this is true. It's their argument, right? So that's why we cannot emphasize the outer clothing. I mean, you think about, you know, when you think about so many different contexts, example, you think about a church in the slum, what they will wear and come. They will come just as they are. They may not have had bath for many days. They'll come. Or you think about a church in a village. They'll come just like they are. You can't say wear your best clothes and come. No. They'll come as they are. But they worship God. They worship in spirit and truth. So... You know, will will their worship be accepted? Of course. Okay. So we have to think about this. Uh, okay.
Good, good questions. Fine. Uh, let's take a break. We are almost, uh, it's 9.48 already. We'll take a 10-minute break, come back. We'll get into the next chapter on grammar, okay? studying the grammar and interpreting scripture, understanding grammar. Let's take a 10-minute break and we come back.